The National Farmers Organization brings to you the following news coverage. NFO Women's Coordinator speaks to American Association of University Women. Would bread prices be lower if farmers gave away their wheat? And collective bargaining at the marketplace. For more on these stories, here's NFO News Analyst Phil Allen. Doris McElwain is Coordinator of Women's Activities for the NFO. Recently, she addressed a meeting of the AAUW, American Association of University Women. Doris, did the AAUW ladies understand the economic situation farmers and ranchers are in? Well, at least they're very concerned and interested. Otherwise, they would not have put together this program that was called a loaf of bread, how many ways it can be sliced. I understand that you asked, uh, you asked this audience and possibly others you've addressed, do any of you need more food? What's your point in asking that? Well, oftentimes you hear about the world food famine and about uh, how more product can be sold from one segment of the agricultural plant or the other. And it seems to me that everyone I encounter has not a problem with calories or intake or food uh, choices. Most of us really are over-consuming. We need to be taking in less. So it's really not a matter of selling more food except as more people come into the picture, but it is a matter of redistribution of dollars that are already being spent from one portion of the uh, gross resort to the other. Very good point. So uh, what about these promotions to sell consumers more of this or that kind of food? Well, since you're not really going to be able to sell the existing consumers more food, uh, you're not really going to be able to increase every segment or every producer's income. It's going to be uh, more of one at the expense of the other. And then also there's a point that I think should be made. Uh, these promotions also promote uh, imported food, which is not the high quality that we produce. Or even promotions of the kind of foods that sometimes get called junk foods. What about that? Well, the non-food or junk food items do compete for the real food dollar, and oftentimes they're not touted as being nutritious, but they do compete. Here's a question that I understand that you raise at many of these gatherings, and that has to do with the economic situation ranchers and farmers are in. How do you get across the point that reduced income for agriculture doesn't just stay in the rural area? Well, we try to show how that one agricultural dollar brings in probably four more into the local community or county structure. And it moves up then to perhaps five or six and a half times in the state and then at least seven times in the gross national product. The Kansas State University and the University of Minnesota had done some studies on these a few years ago about how much the wheat dollar brings in and how the dollar turns in the state. So these dollars that I say are embezzled or shortchanged out of agriculture then depress the economics in these areas by that much. Uh, if when these dollars are not spent in the local communities, then the manufacturing areas uh, are backed up with production, and so they have to send workers home. And the distribution, the uh, transportation, the tax base, all of these things are slowed down and affected also. When you talk to a group of, say, women in a city situation, do they seem to comprehend this? Yes, especially when you tell them that, say, this last year, for instance, 59% of the net egg income, 59% uh, of that was from off-farm jobs. So people who are still on the farm are competing for some of the employment opportunities in the city. And then the people who are totally displaced out of agriculture or out of these smaller towns then are really in the job market or they become part of the tax drain on the people who are already there. Do the non-farm areas have a stake in a family-held agriculture? Oh, absolutely. Uh, their food supply, which has been ample and reasonably priced all these years, depends on the family-held land system still having the ability and the incentive to produce the food and have it available in the terms that Americans are used to having it. Doris, you often make a point which takes some consumers by surprise about the price of bread. Oh, yes. If you want to get their attention, just tell them that if the farmer gave away the wheat, it would make little appreciable difference in the cost of their bread. And you'll get a response every time. Okay. Uh, give us the statistics on that and, um, and sort of prove it to people who may be just as skeptical as audiences you've addressed. 
According to the USDA figures uh, for late 77, a one pound loaf of bread selling at 35 and a half cents contained 2.7 cents worth of wheat. Now this is farm value wheat. If you took all of the total ingredients, the farm value for that is only four and a half cents. But the wheat itself, 2.7 cents, if the farmer gave away the wheat, this would lessen the bread cost only that much. And that's quite a lesson, isn't it, in uh, some of the mechanics of how you get food to the breakfast table. Yes. Carol Foreman made a good point recently when she pointed out that in 1974, when wheat was at an all-time high, the cost of wheat in a loaf of bread was 6.9 cents. Since 74, farm value wheat has gone down 60 percent, 60 percent. And the value of bread at the store has gone up 8 percent. We know from our experience that uh, a lot of farmers get jobs in the town or the city to augment the income of their farm. Are there some statistics on that? Yes, I think when you hook up the fact that farm income is approximately at the 64% of parity level, 59% of the net farm income came from off the farm jobs. These farmers then are competing, farm families are competing for the job market. And in cases where there is total displacement, where people are no longer on the farms or in the small towns, they really are in the job market or else they're on the unemployment rolls. What does it mean to a rural community or family when that farm has to have 59% from off-farm income? Well, then there is less opportunity for a large segment of productive people to be employed in any given area. You have to have the cash flow from agriculture to make the economy in the small towns such that there are productive age levels of people living there. And then this pulls through the pipeline all of the kinds of inputs that makes it possible to keep the John Deere plants and the tire factories and all of the kind of things there go around so that their production lines and warehouses don't plug up so they have to send people home. Now, what does it mean to the people in the cities? The food issue, though, has to be faced by both farmers and consumers. And farmers can't get away from it simply by quitting farming. They are going to have to deal with the need for food every day of their lives. Food in America has come from the most productive plant the world has ever seen, the family-held land system, the most ample supply at the most reasonable cost of any place in the world. Now, the goose that laid the golden egg will continue to make this possible for Americans so that they can spend up to 80 plus percent of their income for other things. But you have to be in business in order to make this possible. And this is what we're saying, that the farm issue and the urban issue are not incompatible and that the farmers and consumers are really allies. Doris, if you don't mind listening to 35 seconds of yourself, I'd like to ask you a question about it. Well, I can stand it if you can. The old marketing system does exactly what it was set up to do. The old marketing structure works beautifully. It works well. But it works for the people who own it and operate it. That structure was built to procure our production. Another thing to say about, uh, about fairness or equity, they are good businessmen and they will buy it as cheaply as they can. As a matter of fact, the structure was set up to do two things, secure a supply, and secure it as cheaply as possible. Okay, Doris, we know from the rest of that that you discussed at length with the crowd what farmers and ranchers can do to cope with the old marketing system. The only equalizer that farmers and ranchers have in the marketplace is collective bargaining, and that simply means selling together. The NFO talks a good deal about a goal of cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Does this strike audiences as being merely self-serving of farmers? I don't think so. A young rural businessman at a meeting in Illinois said, farmers have the freedom to go broke. The only trouble is, you guys will take me with you. You have the Capra Volstead Act to protect the income we both depend on. And I think if you look up and down the main streets in rural towns, you will see that there's a ratio of disappearing farmsteads or farm families and disappearance of businesses in rural towns. All right, what can collective bargaining do for the farms and the businesses? It can give farmers and ranchers the ability 
to put into play for themselves the two well-known business practices that are used in every other business community. Uh, first, a price tag, which simply is a holding action, an individual holding action, if you will. Every item of clothing or business equipment that is used in this country has been held for a price by the seller, and the buyer agrees to it. Even a Coke machine can do that. Also, contracts. If you can establish group contracts, you can then protect those price tags that have been established. Because as an individual, no matter how big an agricultural producer is, he is not able to set his price. You have to realize that this production is going into a marketing system where uh, a half a dozen more or less ultimate buyers or handlers will be receiving this production. Now, the place that industry goes to lower the price or to keep the prices low, or I should say to set agricultural prices, are to the individual sellers. So what would you say to these sellers, these farmers and ranchers? <laughs> well, the first thing I'd say is quit turning on the radio to find out what they've set your price at this day. Uh, you don't see GMC or Master Charge or Safeway or U.S. Steel John Deere or any of these other companies uh, that have a profit motive. Turn on the radio to find out what their prices have been set at. Generally, when you turn on the radio, you hear what they have raised their prices to, and this then, of course, reflects back to our cost price squeeze. These farmers and ranchers must remember that the most important day that they own production is the day they sell it. There's nothing unfeminine about knowing your own business, and farming and ranching is ours. Rural women represent half of the mental wealth that's available to help solve this problem, and I hope that through this busy season, when the gals are near the radio, that they will be thinking about it. That was Doris McElwain, women's coordinator and one of the speakers for the NFO. Phil Allen for NFO News, and that for today is something to think about.